Ladies and gentlemen, please prepare yourselves for the end of life as you know it. Your home is about to be transformed by light. Twenty-seven years after laser beams were first discovered, scientists, again at BT, are trying to make them economical and efficient enough to form the basis of a communications network operated almost entirely by light waves. One single laser beam could carry thousands of TV channels or millions of phone conversations simultaneously. But before it can all happen, they must have a cheap and reliable type of optical fibre. To make optical fibre, the first thing you need is a hollow silica glass tube like this one. You pass gases down through the centre of it, causing a reaction which makes new layers of glass build up inside. Then you extract those gases, and what you're left with is a solid glass tube like this one. Those new layers of glass have now formed a central core down the middle, and it'll be that core that carries the light beam. The next step is to heat it. And you do that in this machine. Here's a glass rod already in there. It's about a centimetre in diameter. It'll go down through a furnace and be heated to about 2,000 degrees centigrade. And in the meantime, it'll be stretched. The whole operation is pretty much like pulling peppermint rock. The fibre is used in tests to find the best formula. The laser going through it will be pulsing on and off millions of times a second, so it must have total internal reflection so that none of the information is lost or distorted. In the end, it's no thicker than a human hair and the glass tube is now 10 kilometres long. What we're trying to do here at Martlesham is to capitalise on a concept known as through the network optically. In other words, what we're trying to do is send energy through the fibres, obviously in light form, and transmit the light all the way through the network without converting it back into electrical form. Now we have to do this because sometimes the signal levels drop down, we have to amplify it, especially if we go long distances. We have to convert our light energy back to electrical energy when we wish to do switching. So what we're trying to do now is amplify our light in light form and switch in light form. That's what's being tried here, using a specially tinted fibre that will let through some colours of light, that is, certain wavelengths, but not others. They're also working on lasers that will transmit data accurately at different wavelengths at the same time. Every single colour of the rainbow would be information packed and sent down a fibre optic. The shape of things to come. It's a purpose-built optoelectronic facility house near Ipswich, the only one of its kind outside Japan. Basically, it'll mass-produce the bits that go on either end of the optical fibre, the light source and the receiver. The secret processes of this new growth industry must be carried out in a completely clean environment. From a wafer-thin layer of semiconductor, they make a laser no bigger than a full stop. On this one dish, there are 500 of them. Inside this tiny box with its optical fibre is a minute laser chip. There's another chip which controls the light output, yet another one which stops the laser from overheating while it's operating, and there's even room for the customer to put in his own integrated circuit so that he can use the box to do whatever he wants it to do. Now, the whole box is worth about a thousand pounds. But if the manufacturing processes which are being attempted here by BT and D are successful, then this box could be brought down in price to just 50 pounds. And when that happens, we really are in for an optical revolution. Now, dig one foot in or whatever. This cable TV set in central London is an example of what can be done with optical fiber. It's linked to the most advanced cable network of its kind in the world. It's interactive, so I can choose from a library what film I want to watch. The signal from my handset goes directly to the head end miles away, and a laser disc is put onto a turntable. It's like a video jukebox. Loading takes about 30 seconds, and remember, this is not a conventional video, yet only I see what's on my screen. 
I can even call up an index of the birds in the film and choose to look at one of them again. The system was designed with educational uses in mind. This could be the reference library of the future, with films, books or music instantly accessible to anyone with a TV. Once in position, I have the same facilities as a video would have. Currently, the library has mostly feature films in it. The most popular selections are duplicated, so no one has to wait their turn. The interactive video library was invented by BT at Martlesham. The first people to buy it were Westminster Cable, who have 300 customers. Naturally, you'd need a lot of disc players for a major network, but it's estimated that just 300 would serve 10,000 viewers. It's all possible because optical fibers can carry messages in both directions and then send the broadband signals of a film down the same line and still have space left over. From the head end, the fibers run under London's roads to your TV via street-side switching centers. So now we have the capacity to get moving pictures down to individual subscribers. We've also got the capacity in the network to get those moving pictures back from subscribers into the network. And this opens up the possibility of video telephones or view phones, whereas subscribers on the network could communicate with one another in sound and in video. And of course, by interconnecting those circuits within the network to our national and even international links, it is possible to have two-way video um, throughout the whole country. We can have data coming down which can be displayed on the television set. You can interact with it. You may be able to vote, for instance. Uh, and there are some schemes in America uh, whereby they say, what ending would you like to a particular film? You actually vote and the ending you want comes up. The latest interactive service shortly to be tried is a remotely ordered meal. You press the relevant button, the message goes directly to the head end and is instantly relayed to the restaurant via their interactive TV. We could have an optical network in just 10 years. Our communication system for the next century will have evolved from space age lasers and the mechanics of a 50s jukebox. We would like to show you how the system will work and why this technologically advanced system should be shown to the world in our capital city. British Telecom's research laboratory at Martlesham, under the leadership of Bill Ritchie, has developed an actual cable station head end, integrating known technology and drawing on the experience of Milton Keynes. But let John Powter explain how the system works after the television signals have been received either by landline or by satellite. The signals from the satellite dishes appear on this rack of equipment here. The signals from satellites are either those signals distributed by the satellites for distribution to cable head ends or the DBS signals coming from the satellite. They all appear here and are mixed with the off-air signals. These are the demodulators for the off-air signals. These are the demodulators for the FM radio. And all the signals are assembled together for transmission down the optical fiber primary routes. We've also got here tape recorders for locally originated programs and over here we've got the library system. The video library system consists of banks of video disc players. They're expandable in modules of 64 players up to a maximum of 256 players. The discs that uh, are played on these players are standard discs which you can go and buy from the shops. And we've extended this system such that you can actually control access to this disc from your home. And you'll see something of that a little later on. You've seen the program sources and the video library system now. These are the entertainment sources. But of course, behind all this has got to be the brains of the system. The system administration center, which keeps track of customer records, sends bills out, and this sort of thing. Well, this is a system administration center. These computers receive information from the subscriber and pass it on to the various subsystems in the totality of the system. Behind me here is the main system administration computer. This keeps a customer database, customer records, and produces the billing information. Other computers in the system keep the local video text database and also the picture video text database. These computers have to be accessed 
and they're accessed from terminals rather like these over here. Now these terminals can be remote from the main computers, in fact it's very likely they will be. They'll probably be in the offices of the cable operator, the cable provider and the program provider. These groups of people need to know things from the system. For instance, the cable provider needs maintenance information. If anything goes wrong, what can he do about it? Where's it gone wrong? The program provider needs to know how popular his programs are, how many people have been watching it at certain times of the day. And the cable operator really needs to know a lot about the system. Basically, he needs to know how it's working, am I making enough money from it? All this information he can get out from simply typing in this keyboard here. So now, having looked at the System Administration Centre, we ought to go farther downstream, out into the field, to have a look at the equipment that we find on our way to the customer. In other words, the wideband switch point. Well, this is the sort of cabinet that you'd find by the side of the street, or in the basement of a block of flats, uh, or in the basement of an office block. This is an experimental model that we've got here in our laboratories. And when it's mounted in the field, the ground level will be about, be about here. So what does it contain? Well, the signals from the head end come down on optical fiber cables. And the optical signal is converted into an electrical signal in these fiber optic demodulators here. The electrical signal is then transmitted via the back of this equipment to these switch modules over on this side. These switch modules are controlled from the customer and enable him to select which programs he wants to watch. And having made his choice, those programs are transmitted to him over coaxial cable. Those are these things here. Into this patch frame and then from here via multi-tube coaxial cables to his door. These switch units are installed in modules of 30. So as customers come onto the service, a new an additional switch module is installed. As well as that, each switch module has launch modules which plug into the front of it. And as the customers come on and are connected, they're connected across to the next available launch module, as you can see there. In this way, the initial capital cost of the system is kept low, and the equipment is provided as the customers need to be connected. From the wideband switch point, the coaxial cables come out and radiate down to single cables which enter the customer's premises. You can see that single cable here running along the top of the skirting board and into the customer's termination unit. This can be mounted behind the television set or in the loft or in the garage, anywhere that's convenient. The system provides for two channels to be delivered to the home each of those channels are independently switched. We communicate with the system via a small handheld keypad and a small box on top of the television set. The infrared signals from this keypad are transmitted to the box on top of the TV and from there down the in-house aerial wire to the customer's termination unit. And from there they go back into the network and control the switches that you've already seen in the wideband switch point. The city of Westminster houses over 55,000 hotel rooms. Comfort Hotels International own the Curzon Hotel in Mayfair. Douglas Oram is the director of purchasing for the group. It will open up a much wider range of uh, entertainment to hotel guests. It will also give them information services which at the moment it simply isn't practical to provide. For example, Prestel is something that one simply can't provide in hotel bedrooms at the moment. Uh, firstly, because of the capital cost of the equipment, one needs a specially adapted set. Secondly, because with Prestel there are page charges, uh, which we simply can't recapture. How will a busy young housewife with children use this system? Oh, I think the uh, advantages are definitely in the banking facilities and being able to compare prices of uh, groceries on the list provided and perhaps in some cases order them. Uh, that would probably leave me a lot more time to be with my children. Also, the computer aspect, I think, is very useful because my children...
And Jason, a professional in a busy industry, is a typical resident who also works in the city of Westminster, and he is often not able to see the films that he wants. But let him explain how cable television will let two of his interests be enhanced. I think well, you know, one of the advantages of the system is that I can come home after working late at night, which I do quite often, um, and catch up with a lot of movies that I've missed on you know, um, normal network TV. One of my other great interests is ornithology. Um, when it comes to studying, say, the patterns of bird flight, for example, the system enables me to actually control a program that you can get um, via the system backwards and forwards with your own little handset, which means that I can actually study the birds frame by frame, can do drawings from the television set, you know, compare them with notes in books. And it's great because you can run and play around for as long as you like. George Theo is creative manager of Darcy McManus and Macius. Although he is interested in the cable services available to the vast service business population in Westminster, he also sees cable services in broader context. In terms of a new medium, I think one of the most exciting aspects is the potential for narrow casting rather than broadcasting. Um, it will allow us as an agency to reach a much more select audience with the right kind of message more precisely. It's, you know, a very local type of medium. Um, this also can even benefit the consumer. You can transmit a, a cat food commercial on a channel that's really beamed at pet owners, so people who are not really interested in pets don't see a cat food commercial. So there's an, a bit of an advantage, I think, for the consumer there. On switch on, the user will be presented with a menu something like this. The choice is between standard television, video tech services or the video library. Standard TV offers 30 or so channels of scheduled viewing, including off-air, DBS and pay channels. For example, BBC One, Channel 4, Movies, sports and pop videos. Videotex offers access to a local text service and thereby a gateway to national databases like British Telecom's Prestel. The Videotex service will include local information and access to advanced services like teleshopping, telebanking and electronic mail. It will also offer access to photographic video text, allowing for classified advertisements with good quality still pictures incorporated on the screen. The video library is a new service whereby a customer will be able to choose what he wants to watch when he wants to watch it, no longer being constrained to the schedules of TV channels. The customer will possess a printed catalogue of up to 1,000 titles, but in this demonstration we show a selection of five titles from the small demonstration pool. We punch in the catalogue number we require. We confirm our request and on a real system probably enter a password. After a few seconds our program will start. The program is now dedicated to the user on a one-to-one -one basis. Any further requests for the same title from another user will result in another copy of the program being accessed. I can now either sit and watch the program or interact as I wish. I can go rapidly forward or stop or go in slow motion. These functions are performed by pressing dedicated keys on the subscriber's keypad. Or else I can access slightly more advanced facilities via a single key which displays a menu. On this menu you can see that I can change the audio status, clear or set the index display and go to specific locations on the program. Let me now set the index display on 
and then return to the same menu. And then ask to go to a specific frame number so I can see the Kingfisher sequence, which is at frame 37670. I enter hash when I'm happy that I have keyed the number correctly. Note that the system tells me what is going on, not leaving me with a blank screen whilst searching. I will now go in slow motion from this point. Stop, and then ask him to put the fish back. The user interface we have developed is inevitably simple as it has to cater for all standard commercially available disks. However, there is clearly the potential for highly interactive programs as we have a video source dedicated to a user who can send keystrokes from a keypad to that source to control it. The possibilities in the educational field for video encyclopedia and full moving quality video home catalogues are obvious. At any time I can leave the library and return to the main system menu.